come. Yes, we can. Person, woman, man, camera, TV. What the fuck is wrong with you? Well, welcome to uh, What the Franklin. I'm Chip Franklin, and it's great to have you here on this Tuesday. Um, boy, there's a lot to talk about today, and uh, I'm waiting for Brooke Minkowski to join us from Truth or Fiction, formerly of Snopes. But uh, as, as is the case when you do these things live, sometimes they don't work out. She's not here yet, but we'll keep our fingers crossed. Still to come in the show today, uh, Mark Fisher will be with us. Mark is a senior editor at The Washington Post, an old friend of mine, one of the smartest guys in the business. He's been doing it for, <clears throat> I don't know. God, almost 30 years, maybe more. And he'll join us. We'll talk a little bit about what's going on with um, the Trump investigation and uh, Jack Smith, who is the latest uh, to head up a special counsel as appointed by Merrick Garland and try to get to the bottom of all that. Um, we also obviously will take your thoughts and comments, too. You can uh, join us, too, by putting you know right in the corner there. You'll see you can comment and we'll get to some of your comments throughout the show. We don't have phone calls like we used to, but this is fun as well. Um, a couple of things I want to start the show with, I want to talk about, because they mean a lot to me. Um, when my kids were small, my brother-in-law owns a home in, in a place called Provincetown, Massachusetts. And if you've never been there, it's, um, it's kind of, well, depending on what city you live in, in San Francisco, you might say Hill, uh, you might say um, Castro. Uh, in San Diego, you might say Hillcrest. That's where I live now. Uh, and, and all across the country, there are neighborhoods that have pretty much been exclusively gay for a long time. Provincetown, grew up under the, the nose of Portuguese fishermen. Uh, they were the first people to settle there hundreds of years ago. And over time, uh, it was really amazing to see and really exciting to see uh, the town grow up. And, and it grew up as a, as a gay enclave. So when we were, um, my wife and I were young and our kids were born, we'd go to visit my brother-in-law. There was a, it's a beach town and we take our kids. So my kids grew up seeing drag queens, seeing gay couples, seeing men hold men's hands, seeing women hold women's hands. In fact, we went up every year pretty much right around, uh, they call it family week. And it was really exciting and uh, to see my kids. And I, I bring this up, obviously, because of the shooting in Colorado and, and the heartbreaking uh, aspect to this. Um, and so there's a couple of things I want you to see. This is uh, the, the police department in Colorado Springs uh, talking about, and this is going to be the best video you're going to see today. They're talking about um, the people who died and how to handle uh, recognizing them, their names and everything. And, and I think this, this is the best video, obviously, that you're going to see today. Listen up, watch this. We respect all of our community members, including our LGBTQ community. Therefore, we will be identifying the victims by how they identified themselves and how their families have loved and identified them. The first person I'll identify is Kelly Loving. Kelly's pronouns are she, her. Daniel Aston. Daniel's pronouns are he, him. Derek Rump. Derek prona Derek's pronouns are he, him. You get it, right? I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, I was on Twitter and Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is back on Twitter now. And, um, you know, we can, we'll talk about that some other time. But uh, she retweeted a, a, um, a piece by a guy named Jack Posibiak. He is, uh, I think I got his pronunciation of his name. I just see his name. And he wrote, are we not supposed to talk about the U.S. Army major taking his family down to a local drag club for a night out? Yeah, What's so unusual about that? These are human beings. Why would you condemn people like that? My kids are great. My kids have grown up around people who are who feel free to express who they feel, who they are. I, I don't get it. My friend Joe, who was on the show yesterday, she goes, actually, I'd welcome a conversation about a U.S. Army major taking his family to a drag club. I'd love to ask Jack what exactly is wrong with that. And then, and then I'd like to ask him, why is it that he's so very threatened by a man dressed in women's clothing? Tell us, Jack, won't you? Love Joe. That's Joe Joe from Juris. Check her out on Twitter. Um, so we had a lot coming up. Uh, later on in the show, um, Chris Titus, one of my favorite comedians in the world, 
he'll be with us. And just here's a little bit from his uh, his show and what you can expect. So I want you to stay with us. If you were supreme, Sean Ted Nugent Cruz Hannity, <laughs> maybe you could walk the world with courage and calm and wouldn't be so scared out of your mind all the time you needed to carry an AR-15 into an Applebee's. I don't think a supreme being needs hollow point ammunition to protect his chili fries. <laughs> anyway, Chris will be with us in the second half hour. And as I mentioned, coming up in just a little bit, uh, will be Mark Fisher, senior editor to the Washington Post. Um, this Our next guest is, is somebody that uh, I've known for a while. I don't remember exactly how long, but I've, I've always loved her work, and she's just done a great job back with Snopes. Now she's with TruthOrFiction.com. Um, she is our uh, true seeker. She's nice enough to join us here on uh, the What the Franklin. Hello, Miss Binkowski. Hello. Uh, I seem to be – I've, I've got something going on on my end. I don't know why. No, you, you look see? fine. You look fine. I look all right? Okay, cool. Yeah, we'd well, like to see more of you, but that's fine. That's great. <laughs> well, in a while. I mean, maybe while. 20 years ago, but maybe not now. <laughs> yeah. did, did you and I, do we go back before California or do you remember? Because when I was doing my show in Baltimore. I, I think I know you from San Diego because I worked in San Diego radio for a long time. And uh, so I always kind of you know, got invited to the parties for a while. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this. So how did you end up, you're a journalist, how did you end up working for Snopes and then Truth or Fiction? Because um, it's it, it's a really unique gig. I mean, it's kind of what reporters are supposed to do anyway, you know, um, right? And But you guys found this niche that was obviously important. And there's 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 others out there. But I mean, you know, the one you're working with right now, Maybe a little less known than Snopes, but Truth or Fiction is great. I love it. So how'd you end up there? And tell me what the job's like. Well, uh, it's changing now because the nature of the disinformation is changing. But until the, for the last five or six years. So first of all, I started uh, in Counter Disinfo in 2015, and it was totally by accident. What happened was um, I saw that. So I've been looking for work for, for like two years. I couldn't find a steady uh, gig because journalism and because my specialty was the border. And nobody wanted anything to do with border stories, border journalism, and the U.S.-Mexico border, human rights violations there, uh, the sort of surveillance tactics that were going on. I had this conspiracy theory for years. It was my two-beer conspiracy theory. And by that, I mean it would take like two beers for me to start talking about it, it one half a beer. Um, and it, I would basically call her the person closest to me and go, you need to know what's going on at the U.S.-Mexico border. They're coming for us next. There's a far right power grab and the tip of the spear is going to be CBP. Like I, I wouldn't shut up. I was such a crank about this. So then when this happened, I was like, oh my God, um, you know, holy crap, I need to start playing the lottery. But so before that though, um, I wanted to get a job uh, to support my border work uh, because I, I discovered that nobody wanted to hire a full-time uh, journalist who was reporting at the US-Mexico border. And also my interest was refugee rights, borders everywhere. Um, you know, the sorts of cultures that arise in border situations um, and immigration in general. Those were my interests because- you know, um, And I remember, um, I remember specifically when there was the, um, the caravan, right? The one that, that Trump railed on. And I remember reading some incredible statistics, for example, like Honduras had a higher uh, percentage of children vaccinated, uh, MMR vaccinations, right? So everybody yeah. was worried about them coming into Texas when actually the refugees were the ones that should have been worried, right? Things like that. It yeah, it, it, and that's a very common trope. It goes back to, I mean, it goes back forever, right? But uh, most recently, it goes back to the Nazi era when immigrants and refugees were demonized as being, you know, disease carriers and well poisoners. That was a big anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theory for a long time that the Nazis, and I mean like the actual Nazis in Germany, not the ones that are running around now trying to recreate Nazi Germany, the, yeah. you know, weak ass white supremacists. But um so, so I was doing all this border work and I was, I mean, I didn't know what we were living under was a uh, disinformation narrative after disinformation narrative. You know, I mean, I was working through Gamergate, which was a big thing because my job has always had a big online component. I was, I was doing the border stuff. I was, I was doing the refugee rights stuff and I was always very online. It didn't occur to me until much later that all these things were connected um, and they were connected and being fused together in some sort of like Uber disinformation model. So anyway, at, in 2015, I started, well, 2014, I started looking for full-time work because again, I just really wanted to support my, my border habit, which is how I put it at the time. And I just got out of grad school and I was just like ready to go and start paying down my debt. 
and um nobody would hire me like nobody nobody would even call me back or or I would get like a, a call back and then they look at my resume and there would be this moment where I would see them realizing I wasn't like 25 because you know my resume said I just graduated um and so there would be this moment where they realized I wasn't 25 and then they would realize that I'd had like 15 years of solid experience and then I would feel the air in the interview rooms go cold and I'd be like oh god I didn't get this job because they know they know I'm going to start unionizing the station and asking for more money like they know exactly what I am so um, well you know and, and Brooke it's interesting because uh, coming up after you Mark Fisher is going to join us do you know yeah. Mark yeah, I do. I don't know him, know him, but I know who he is. Yeah, we're, we're old friends. He's a senior editor of the Washington Post. And and I know the Post over the years. I mean, I remember the Jason Blair fiasco and the Janet Cook, which you figure, you know, with these newspapers that have been around for a century, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, you're going to occasionally get burned, you know. But I guess the question I have for you and a lot of people probably want to know this is how do you ascertain what is the truth and how does that process work? If you get, for example, say we hear that, you know, like Trump is, was saying the other day or Marjorie Taylor Greene, that we've had five million cross people cross the Mexico border this year. And most of them are drug dealers and rapists. Obviously, that's bullshit. But how do you we prove that that's not true? Well, it's really hard to prove a negative. Right. So right. They, they know that. Um, what I've been trying to do is raise awareness of the Tansen Network, which is a network of lobbyists and uh, disinformation purveyors um, and policymakers and so on. Um, that's very, very well funded by now. That's been around for about 50 years. And it was created by John Tanton, um, who was a retired ophthalmologist who got his panties all in a wad about overpopulation, right? And right. Um, so we started writing all these letters and typing them up and writing them. And I guess you can, you know, you can do a lot when you type up letters and send them around. Um, so in the 60s and 70s, or sorry, in the 70s and 80s, he started writing these letters and, and connecting people and asking for funds. And then at around the same time, um, Tom Metzger and David Duke, this is in 1977, 1978, uh, went to the U.S.-Mexico border as part and of this. Those of y'all remember, David Duke was a former Klansman who ran for president, I believe. What state? Oh, God. Uh, Illinois, I think. Yeah, I, I'm not. No, I don't, I, he came synonymous with with white supremacy and that whole thing for a period of time when we all thought it had been pretty much pushed down until obviously 2016. But go ahead. I'm sorry. It's okay. I, and, and now I just want to point out, like, I don't generally dunk on people for having a lot of plastic surgery, like, you know, it, to each their own, you know, but that guy looks like freaking carrot top at this point. He has had his teeth veneered and bleached and it, like, you know, his face lifted and it's like, oh yeah, behold the master race right there. Yeah. yeah right. So um, something wrong with a master race if they need to go to a plastic surgeon, right? Right. Yeah. Like, uh, it's not mastery. Anyway, um, so in By the way, that's what uh, Chris Titus is going to talk with us about at 940 this morning. So if you can't hang in there, he's a comedian. Very funny. But anyway, go ahead. So I'm sorry. I keep interrupting you. Oh, no, no. It's totally fine. I don't mind at all. Um, I'm an interrupter myself. So um, let's see. Oh. Tom Metzger. So Tom Metzger was the California clan guy, and he ended up living in San Diego for decades and recruiting from here, from San Diego. And uh, a lot of that has a huge border component. And he was a big fan of uh, lone wolf white supremacist violence and um, stochastic terrorism, right? So he advocated for infiltration at all levels and stochastic violence in order to get his way, along with these disinformation narratives. And he found, he and David Duke found that they could get a lot of traction in the 70s, or in the 70s, they discovered this, right? I mean, the traction action continues by invoking the border. And so uh, this guy, John Tanton, um, you know, it was like a match made in hell because John Tanton was obsessed with overpopulation, but only overpopulation when it was people who didn't look like him. That is to say white Republicans. Well, that's an interesting too, because I remember you telling me this once and, and, and I didn't realize the numbers, but there's a strong plurality of people here who are, quote, illegal, who are white Europeans who overstayed their visa. I mean, it's a mm -hmm, chunk, mm -hmm. you know, and the flip side of that also, and, I, and I've heard this before from you as well, that um, both um, epidemiologists and public well, people of census officials, former and present, say that without immigration, our GDP is going to fall dramatically over the next yes. 20, 25 years. Right. We need immigration badly. We need immigration badly, but also, you know, it's. Like we made a promise to the world after World War II. We made this promise. The United States promised never again. We promised that we were the ones who were gonna look out for refugees and asylum seekers. We promised this. And now we're gonna go back on it because because why? Because because we don't like the way 
you know, they're, they're trying to cross. The, these are desperate people. It, people who aren't desperate don't show up at the border and, and you know, humiliate themselves and, and subject themselves. They know what they're going to be put through. They're not yeah. stupid people. No. They're not ignorant. You know, everybody's got a phone. They can read the news and keep in touch. And they do it anyway because they want a better life for themselves and for their families. And I, I mean, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just thinking. So it must have been incredibly hard uh, as a reporter trying to ascertain the truth with Trump lying so many times. Here's just a small sample. I have been on their cover like 14 or 15 times. I think we have the all-time record in the history of Time magazine. The audience was the biggest ever, but this crowd was massive. Look how far back it goes. This crowd was massive. I guess it was the biggest electoral college win since Ronald Reagan. Obamacare covers very few people. The fake media goes, Donald Trump has changed his stance on China. I haven't changed my stance. Now, the Paris Agreement, they all say it's non-binding. Like hell, it's non-binding. I could go on. I have, I have literal, I mean, thousands of those. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I didn't answer your question. I kind of went off on my own. So uh, I was saying it's impossible to prove a negative. But what you can do is fill that negative space with actual facts that are, you know, that people can go back and check. You know, open source uh, uh, journalism is a great way to go about things because everybody can go and check your work for you. You know, we always try to show our work. Um, so that's one way of going um, uh, going up against these disinformation narratives. Another way is they're obvious lies. I mean, this is disinformation. It's malinformation. It's not just a simple mistake. It's not just, you know, a lack of context. It's, it's, it's bald faced brazen lying yeah. by bullies. And what's happening is you're seeing these bullies winning. Nobody's pushing back against it. Nobody's defending the truth. They're just like, oh, well, if Trump says it was the biggest crowd ever, we're going to say this. We're going to normalize this. Trump says his crowd is the biggest ever. Critics say, maybe that's not the case. No, you come out swinging. You defend the truth. Journalists, please stop normalizing these freaking lies. You know, you come out and you are a defender of the truth. You know, I, I see a lot of journalists going, well, I don't want to seem like an activist. Guess what? You're, you are an activist. You're an activist for communication, for freedom of speech, for the written word, for the spoken word. And you better never forget yeah. it. Because if you're not standing up for books and for writing information and for the truth, then why are you even freaking doing this? And, I'm and trying so hard not to. <laughs> but for the record, I mean, Democrats aren't perfect. There are no angel wings on their back either. I mean, um, Biden recently was describing the um, uh, the student loan uh, uh, executive order as as a law. And he knew it wasn't a law. It was an executive order. And but I mean, it's and you know, of course, we can go back 25 years to I did not have sex with that. You know, so you can go, <laughs> we, we you know, or Anthony Weiner. And we do have that. But I think the thing that that's different now. And I, I, I know that you got to agree with this, is that there's not this whole echo chamber of people supporting the lie when they know it's a lie. Yeah. And that's the it, part that's frustrating. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, th there is an echo chamber. Um, yeah, that's frustrating. But what's not what, what I think is really cool is that now I'm seeing people push back, like not journalists, you know, uh, well, some journalists, too, but just like people in the public. They're just saying, no, that is a lie. I lived through this and you don't get to say that you don't get to rewrite this for me. And that I love. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the thing that bothers me the most about the lies um, and you can look at what happened in Colorado Springs. Uh, the, this, this continual, you know, I mean, again, Tucker Carlson uh, has been talking about this. Watch this. Anderson Lee Aldrich committed mass murder because you complained about the sexualizing of children. Sexually mutilating kids. Sexually mutilating children. The sexual mutilation of children. The sexuality of children. People mutilating the genitals of children, running ads on Instagram promoting kitty porn. Jesus. So when I when I see this and I see that these continue lies that Trump or other public officials start. And um, by the way, we're talking to Brooke Binkowski from Truth or Fiction dot com. Um, I see this and it, it, it gets people like this Aldrich and others. I don't know exactly with him, but we you know, we hear from these people afterwards. We see their writings. We, you know, we hear their 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 missives that they put together. And of course, they have been influenced by political leaders who, if they don't espouse this, they don't stand up to the lies, right? And, they, and, and silence can be, you know, as the, as the saying goes, silence is, is violence. In many cases, it actually is. Silence is violence, but also the rhetoric directs the violence, the stochastic violence that we're seeing everywhere. Look, what's, look for, for decades, we've had school shootings, you know, and then when you look at the GOP's rhetoric, They've been hammering public schools for, well, for decades. They've yeah. been hammering 
public schools. They've been hammering public institutions. Uh, they're, they're going after books, libraries. Um, they're going after school boards. And you see where the rhetoric is leading this. You know, you see where the, the implied and actual violence is taking place because that's where the rhetoric is directing them. It's giving pe bad people permission to do the violent, terrible things that they always wanted to do anyway. You know, the laws and rules don't exist for everybody. They exist for people who know they're hurting others and do it anyway. And those are the people who are being empowered. I, I have this theory that like 30% of every population just wants to watch everything burn. And those are the people who are being handed power right now. And we have to protect society from the rest of those people because otherwise they'll burn it all down and destroy Look our institutions. I love it. Will you come back, please? Of course, always for you. I love to introduce people to you because they, you know, I, I got a lot of comments already here where they love your energy, your enthusiasm, and your commitment to the truth. Coffee. Thank you. All right. You be well. Thank you. You too. Take care of yourself. Jeff, always, it's always great know, to talk to you. Are you still in San Diego? Always. I don't think oh. I'm ever going to leave again because I love paying too much. Well, I'm here too. So we'll get together. Okay. Cool. That'd be awesome. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Again, Brooke Pinkowski from uh, Truth or Fiction. Dot com. And uh, just, you know, that is that's going to be the future because now there's so many people and so many options. And we've seen what Elon Musk has done with Twitter, allowing people to say whatever they want with absolutely no um, uh, ombudsman there at all. I, I don't know if there ever was or, or I should expect it. Um, our next guest is from The Washington Post, where he's a senior editor and uh, one of those guys, too, a hero. Uh, he, you know, he, I don't want to make him embarrassed here, but uh, The Washington Post and their work in the past six years, I know I'm not speaking just for myself, have made a huge difference in getting us through this. And um, I don't say it enough to you, Mark, but, you know, and to your colleagues, uh, we really appreciate the hard work you guys do. Thank you. That's much appreciated. So I'm a, can you give me some more volume there, big guy? Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> uh, it's OK. That's all right. No, no, I can. Uh, we, everybody can turn you up if they have a problem. They're going to hear more of me. Um, okay. First of all, that was uh, that was truth or fiction. And there's you know, Snopes and there's other groups. How diligent are you guys at the post and making sure everything that goes online or goes to, to print uh, is as it's supposed to be? Well, we try, um, you know, the, the traditional ways of doing that um, for the print newspaper involved lots of people, lots of eyes on every story. And so there were layers of editors. One of the things that happened to all news organizations, particularly the big legacy news organizations over the last couple decades, is there were big cutbacks in those layers. So copy editors and uh, the, the, the sort of third read, fourth read of every story, uh, that kind of fell away as the impetus became move fast, get yeah. stuff online. So uh, we went through a period where people just put stuff raw online and that clearly was not good. Uh, so we, we pulled it back. We do have multiple editors looking at every story before it is published, but when a story is breaking, when something's happening at uh, you know the Club Q situation, uh, Everybody wants to be first. Everybody wants to be right. Those are often in tension with each other. And so uh, there's there are a lot of versions of stories that keep updating. Um, it's not perfect, but it uh, we do try to make sure that uh, everything is checked at least a couple of times before it's published. Um, my wife used to live over in uh, Chevy Chase. Um, you know, she was in a group house with a couple other girls next door to Ben Bradley. And I would see him as walking his dog. And of course, Ben Bradley, if, if you remember a few good men, he was like, Woodstein, you know, give me another source. Right. It was it was the, the whole idea was it's like I want to make sure that anything that leaves this building is is as close to the truth as we possibly can be as as human beings. Um, and I would always go up to him and, and thank him. And very, you know, he was you know, he'd shake his head. He'd see us coming and he goes, you don't have to say anything or something. Like that. He was a great guy. And I, I think about those characters. Um, Today, you know, obviously getting the truth out in these, like you said, in a timely manner, everybody wants to be first. Um, but, but I think that there are discerning readers and, and, and um, people who take in the news, understanding that it does take a little bit of time. I've worked with some of those people at KGO when I was there. I had some reporters and the news would break and number of dead would go up and down and we'd always wait to get some certification from the people on the ground there because it's important. It's important to get it and not go back and forth. All that said, 
Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Jack Smith and uh, what happened uh, recently with Merrick Garland appointing this special counsel. Is because here's my take, and I'm kind of curious what you think. My sense is there's an indictment coming and that Garland doesn't feel comfortable it coming directly from him and that putting Jack Smith there and, and, a, and a separate counsel separates justice just slightly, even though it's still part of justice. Any, is, is any of that palatable to you? Well, certainly the motive for hiring the special counsel uh, is obviously to create some political distance. And uh, we've seen from back before he was elected president that Joe Biden is not eager to uh, litigate the crimes of Donald Trump uh, and steal attention from his own presidency, his own achievements, his own agenda. So he has not been enthusiastic about these investigations from day one. But it's not, he's also very straightforward about the fact that it's not his Justice Department. The Justice Department is an independent actor to a fair extent. And certainly picking Merrick Garland sent that message. This is not a political guy at all. So that's the motive is right, but I don't I don't buy the assumption that an indictment is in the works or coming or decided upon. Why the hell not? I'm I'm speaking for like ten thousand people. When? I don't think ever. Um, I don't I don't think there's uh, any enthusiasm. Certainly on the political side at the White House, the Biden administration for uh, spending their time and energy and and diverting the nation's attention. Uh, to a prosecution of Donald Trump. Now, it's not up to them. It's up yeah. to the Justice Department on the federal level. It's up to the prosecutors in New York and Georgia at the state level. Uh, those folks seem kind of gung-ho about going after Trump or at least the business. Um, but uh, I think the message from Biden has been consistent. He wants nothing to do with this stuff. And um, picking a special counsel is a way of distancing themselves, yes, but there's no special counsel, not Jack Smith or anyone else who would go into a, an arrangement like this with the books already cooked. That's just not the way it works. Uh, so oh. he's going in to do an investigation, not to take an already completed investigation and turn it into an indictment. Question for you. Um, <clears throat> so we've, we've kind of experienced this in the last 30 some years, going back to Ken Starr and then, um, and then seeing um, Robert Mueller and now Jack Smith. Um, there was a big difference between Starr and Mueller. In other words, Starr, if, correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sure you will, Starr could independently act more than Mueller could. Is that accurate? Yes, the, the law changed. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's an independent counsel, there's special counsel. The, the, oh, yeah, the Democrats changed the law, right? They had power when they changed the law, didn't they? Yeah, right. after okay. Starr. So, so the Watergate prosecutor, Jaworski, the, the Ken Starr, they had much more power uh, than special counsels do now. Special counsel is is not a completely independent actor. He works for the attorney general, so he reports to the attorney general. So uh, ultimately, any federal decision to uh, go after Trump would be up to Garland. So the special counsel helps create some uh, patina of distance and independence, but he's still he's, he is temporarily a Justice Department employee. Um, obviously, uh, I mean, it, it's not hard. I mean, even even for someone that doesn't know the law intimately to look and see that there are things that Trump has done that um, as we listen to others and not just MSNBC, um, define a broken law. I mean, from obstruction of justice to <clears throat> the documents. Right. Um, we've we've heard this time and time again. And, and I think um, we, we've gotten to this point, as you just mentioned that it seems like it's this is almost like long COVID, right? The, you know, the symptoms are kind of uh, not really, we can't really, is this a cold or is this? Co so I, I, when I look at this, if, if I think to myself, if we somehow go through the next three or four years without an indictment of the former president, um, does that in, in effect exonerate him for the Republican party and, uh, or do you think maybe the Republican party would like an indictment to put well, him an indictment because it, you know, it, it just deepens the martyrdom arguments. It, it, uh, it deepens all their uh, yeah. conspiracy notions about uh, the Democrats using the system for political gain. Uh, so, uh, you know, in the end, Donald Trump is a wily guy and he has uh, successfully <laughs> danced around, ignored, um, legal judgments against him for half a century. 
So there's no reason, uh, having spent a lot of time examining his life and his uh, writing a biography of him and going back and looking at all the original legal documents, the court cases going back to the 70s, uh, this is a guy who doesn't pay his lawyers, doesn't necessarily tell the truth at depositions. He, he really um, flips the bird at the legal system and takes great pride in doing so. So is he running scared and setting up shell companies and uh, perhaps running for president as a way of trying to shield himself? Sure. But those are just tactics that are part of a much larger bag of tricks that he has uh, that uh, have successfully shielded him from prosecution and responsibility for his actions for half a century. He has every reason to believe he will continue to be able to do that. And uh, for unrelated reasons, he's got the Democrats kind of on his side in as much as they don't want to give him center stage for this stuff. And they don't want him to suck all the oxygen out of the room. They've got an administration, they've got an agenda, they've got a, a 2024 political campaign. Uh, and that's what they want to concentrate on, not the drama, the soap opera around Donald Trump. Perjury is a felony, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and that's just, that's exactly what Bill Clinton did to Judge Weber in that deposition, right? I mean, pretty. I mean, he wasn't convicted of her charge, but he, he lied about something that was he later admitted he lied, right? And he was president of the United States, and so was Donald Trump. And there is a tremendous and probably somewhat justifiable reluctance to put a former president of the United States on trial for something that, right. to some of us, right. was right. impeded. Now, for those people that are screaming at us right now, there's no comparison. I mean, Bill Clinton did not try to uh, incite an insurrection to stop uh, the, the counting of electoral votes and, and, and again, uh, said language that could have caused people to be harmed. And, and in fact, people were. Um, and, and I think that there's a sense in the country. And I, I just wonder if we didn't loathe the guy so much. And I say we, I don't know, I'm bringing you into that. But if, if I didn't loathe him so much, would I want him prosecuted I mean, people do bad things all the time. But if this if this is allowed to go un, unrequited, I don't know if that's the right word, but if this is allowed to go without an ending, um, there's a sense, I think, that in, this, in the Democratic Party, and maybe in mainstream America, that somehow he got away with it. And, and in fact, I think that's exactly what it is. And I know the politics of it. You know, I remember when Gerald Ford pardoned Nixon. And the reaction to that, you know, it's, it's why he didn't get elected, reelected that and in inflation, probably, <laughs> you know, that's, that's exactly where I was going to go. I mean, was was there ever justice uh, uh, in the case of Richard Nixon? No. Most of the country would say no. On the other hand, a significant part of the country would say old guy, bygones be bygones. The next president came in. Jimmy Carter was elected as a reformer to fix some of the problems that allowed Nixon to abuse his office to the extent that he did and did. There was a tremendous wave of reform. And I think that for a lot of people, um, in both parties, there is a sense that political acts, political crimes um, deserve political solutions. And so this month's elections were a statement about Donald Trump's actions. Uh, mm -hmm. The 2024 election has the potential to be a statement about Donald Trump's actions. Uh, is that enough to satisfy people who want to see him behind bars? No. Uh, I recall the anger that I felt uh, when Richard Nixon was pardoned and uh, shared by much of the country. Uh, and yes, it did poison Gerald Ford's presidency. But but Mark, and again, we're talking to Mark Fisher, senior editor at the Washington Post. And again, thank you, uh, from Moskowitz LLP, our sponsors today, tax attorneys in San Francisco. If you ever have an issue, they're the ones. Great people, triple eight tax deal. Um, I think the thing, Mark, that I, that's changed is Fox News, OAN, Newsmax, social media. So in the past, uh, the three major Republican left or right would have all reported the facts this is what Nixon did. This is why Ford did it, or at least the understanding why Ford did it. And we're all going to move on. That ain't happening here now. It's a totally different environment. So I think you can make a case for saying that in order to put, you know, a, a period at the end of this sentence, you have to do something. Um, and, and let me ask you this. How would that actually occur if Smith decides that, in fact, crimes have been committed and, and indictments need, would they have to go back to a grand jury or could 
could the indictment come directly from justice? I'm not sure what the law is on that. I, I, I think it would require a grand jury, but I'm not positive. Um, and, uh, but it, it certainly before any indictment, it would require uh, the attorney general to make that decision openly, yeah. uh, not just the special counsel. Uh, you, know, you know, would he, would, would Garland consult with Biden? He'd certainly inform Biden. Uh, it, it, it's unlikely that he would ask the, the president's permission or green light. Maybe. And this, this is, I mean, I don't know how they're thinking because obviously I'm not there. Maybe a civil case against him might be exactly the ticket that everyone needs where he is stripped of essentially everything he has by, um, you know, New York State and or um, a, a civil case and possibly in Georgia as well. I mean, I don't know if you can really get one. I mean, by the way, you know, Smith can't do anything about what Georgia and Manhattan or New York State want to do. So, I mean, they 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 could still move forward. Right. Absolutely. Those are independent yeah. actors and uh, they can do what, where, you know, go where the facts lead them and make their own political decisions about uh, the appropriateness of uh, indicting a former president. Um, before I let you go, I want to get your take on the red wave that wasn't. Um, and and is that is that should that is that more about um, Roe v. Wade or is it more about just People saying, well, you know, we're done with this guy, this Trump guy. I, I think of Carrie Lake, who is probably going to be his running mate. Wouldn't you, if, if you were going to, if you had to pick somebody today, wouldn't you pick her? Oh, I don't know. He's got a whole, it, it depends on what he's feeling he needs at that point. Um, I think uh, Christy Noam is a, certainly a, a, a strong candidate. Uh, he could decide to go a little crazier. Uh, there's certainly options in that direction. Um, he could decide that he needs uh, something, as he did with Pence, something uh, either uh, to nail down the evangelical vote or just something a little more mainstream. Uh, I don't think Pence was his, ever his choice back in uh, 2016. I think that was kind of pushed on. It was heavily suggested to him, but <laughs> nonetheless, he, he went for it. And he, he felt that there was, the reason he went for it was he felt there was a need to uh reassure uh, evangelicals and moderates and uh, other folks who were, had deep skepticism about him. And I think that motive might be even stronger this time around were he to win the nomination. But as, as far as the red wave, um, look, there, there are certainly places where abortion was an important issue. Uh, I don't think it was determinative at all in, in the general outcome of this election. I think uh, the exhaustion factor was much stronger uh, in, in my own interviews right. with voters, in our polling, in the exit polling. Uh, there's a very strong uh, theme of people saying they're, they're, they want folks to get things done. Uh, they want folks to compromise. And when Americans have that impetus, that initiative, of move, trying to sh nudge the parties back toward the center, they often choose divided government. Uh, which is exactly we, what they did this time. We had Joe Walsh on the show yesterday and former congressman, Republican, former Trump supporter, um, who um, who says that with, there's no doubt in his mind at all and from the people he's spoken to that Trump will be on the ticket uh, in 2024. And and he believes, you know, that that it's he's still the guy to beat. Um, and yeah, I, he's the guy to beat because he's the front runner and that's his party and, and he has his hardcore base. But I think if, if you look at the numbers on enthusiasm, on whether they want him to run, on who, who you'd like to see as the Republican nominee, uh, all of those surveys, the, the numbers have been dropping, dropping, dropping for Donald Trump consistently since January 6th, even before that. And so no one should write him off. He's still the front runner. But uh, there is an exhaustion level with both Biden and Trump in this country that I think is truly powerful. And so... Uh, if the Republicans can uh, narrow the field in such a way as uh, to not let him win with, uh, you know, a tiny plurality, um, then then I think he, he is uh, third or fourth really bid for president is it, it, real trouble. Mark Fisher, senior editor of The Washington Post, a long friend. Thank you so much, buddy. Always good to see you. Be Thanks. well. OK, have a great Thanksgiving. See you, guy. Um, great guy. Just. I've known Mark, I don't know, early 90s and always been that exactly what you saw right there. 
thinks it through before he goes. It's good stuff. Um, by the way, um, you can download all these from your favorite uh, audio source, uh, iTunes, uh, Spotify, whatever. Um, our next guest, though, is 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 a guy. I, you know, I don't know if you guys. I did. I've been doing stand up comedy since like 1980. I know I was five, and uh, it's. I've, I've always been. Um, not always, but I guess the last 30 years, I've uh, been drawn to people who find a way to uh, be funny and also say something. And I think we all kind of lean towards that, at least to a certain extent. Um, our next guest uh, is a guy named Chris Titus. I'm going to play a little bit from, uh, I don't know which one of his tours, but this is, to me, this is the way it should be. So I'd like to talk about white supremacy. <laughs> Because science and fiction and fantasy is my favorite genre. <laughs> Listen, if you were supreme, Bubba E. Lee Wilkes Booth, <laughs> maybe you could have studied quantum physics like Katherine Johnson did. Katherine Johnson was the woman that figured out the math, yes, <laughs> to get men to the moon and back. There was a thousand white dudes at NASA, couldn't figure it out. This black lady walked in and went, I wrote this on a napkin. Is this going to work for everybody? <laughs> Yes. If, if you were supreme, Grand Wizard Tucker Carlson Hitler, maybe you could have finished college like Philip M. Magali. Philip M. Magali is a Nigerian dude, inventor of the world's fastest supercomputer, 3.6 billion calculations per second. Yes, and because of this amazing black man, Bubba, you now get to watch porn on your cell phone during your lunch break at the roofing job. All right, he joins us right now, Chris Titus. Chris, thanks for being here, buddy. <laughs> hey, man, well, that guy seems a little funny. What happened to him? I guess, I guess Twitter sucked the life out of him. Thank God I'm recovering. I'm a recovering Twitter addict now. I'm totally off, man. What's going on with you? Wait a second. So that's what I want to ask. I saw you post the other night um, that you were getting off Twitter. Are you off now? Yeah, I'm off. I'm off. My I left my account, but I'm off. I, you know, and it's weird because uh, I thought I'll get off Twitter. You know, I can't stand. Listen, when the people, the most powerful people in the country – start becoming agents of chaos. If you know anything about history, what happens is we're on the downhill slide. And the only way to, uh, the only way to deal with a narcissist too, is just to get, you know, later. Now, I mean, no one's going to give a crap that I'm gone, but I, I, you know, I guess, well, Trent, cool. Re I guess no. Trent Reznor left too. And, and I guess Trent Reznor for some reason got under Musk's skin. So I, you know, man, the, the reality is, is Twitter is imaginary. That's the whole thing. It's an imaginary bitch site that we all used and it was fun for a while. And like anything else, the new thing will come up and the next thing will show up and I'll just wait for that, man. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a sad time in America right now when we still have these guys after knowing what doesn't work to continue to do it. You know, um, you know, Will Durst, right? Yo, yeah, oh my God. Will, when I was a kid, Will helped me with comedy. I love Will. Will's a San Francisco based comic. Um, had some tough times, had a stroke. He's coming back. We're all wishing him the best. Oh my God. I got to get a hold of him. If you talk to him, do you talk to him a lot? I haven't spoken to him since right before he had the stroke. So it's been a couple of years. I will years. track it down. Him and Debbie, I loved, I just love yeah, them both. good people. When I, was, when I was a young comic and everyone else was slamming me into the lockers, uh, metaphorically, in the at the open mics, Durst would take me aside and go, you really suck. Here's how to not suck. So yeah. <laughs> well, and the reason I brought it up is Will is a political comic. Not a lot of political comics anymore out. Um, you're not strictly a political comedy, but you do it well. And it's hard, as you know, because it, it, it implies that people have a certain level of knowledge <laughs> for you to do a setup. Right. And, you know, I mean, I, it's scary. I guarantee you that and I, I shouldn't say this to the audience, but there's a good chunk of people watching this right now. Couldn't tell you how many people are in Congress. Maybe that's not that important, but maybe they should know their own congressmen or two U.S. senators. And I think they, that's even a lower number. Um, I think that as, as you try to do you know, obviously any kind of irony, you know, and, and which people keep saying is dead. And if, that, if I were the day irony dies, we're gone. Right. If we, we right. can't see the effects of the unintended consequences of our actions, but you do it so well. And, you know, when you did, I can't even remember, because I remember your show. How long ago did, did you have your show on network 20, television? It was, uh, it was almost 20 years, I think in March, it was 20, 20 years. It was 20 years when it, when it ended. I just got, the weird thing is that Fox out of the blue called. I was in Scotland and they called out of the blue and they, we just had a meeting about something possible. So don't hold your breath, but we ah. had a, yeah. Yeah. Weird. Right. They said that uh, I asked them why I actually said that was the first thing in the meeting. I go, all right, guys, it's been a while. I know I'm still doing stuff, but why, why are we calling me back? And they said that 
uh, well, every time we have a meeting with somebody who wants to pitch a new show, they say, I want to do something like Titus. And, what, <laughs> and that's been going, so that's been going on for about seven, eight years now. And someone just said, why don't we just call Titus? So, and I said, did you ask first go, is he dead? He's not dead. Right. <laughs> um, but you, what you're talking about political, I don't mean to be political. I, I, every episode, every show I've done has been like, so it's been like a personal and then like the new one's personal carrying monsters is, about, is the darkest thing I've ever written. I was actually in Scotland for the fringe festival. It's great, by the way, it's really yeah. good. Really yeah, yeah, and they would they would laugh and then go, Jesus Christ! <laughs> but I go, it goes. It usually, I'm saying is is um, personal, social, political, personal, social, political, and I, I think that um, my favorites are Carlin and Robin Williams, my favorite two of all time, all right, uh, and uh, and prior to because prior got to the heart of the matter when it came yeah. personal, and I think. Carlin was the best at it, although Carlin always took this thing where it was like at one point you were like, I'm not sure I like this guy. He's yelling at me. You know, it was like it was like that teacher that you knew was it was like a, a karate instructor that kept slapping you. You're like, oh, yeah, I know I'm learning the right thing. But Jesus, quit yelling at me. Carlin was always uh, brilliant. And Robin did it with such heart. I, I uh I just think it's part of a comedian's job. And when I love when people get mad. Hey, man, why don't you go back to your day job, bro? Why, oh, why? You're not supposed to. Just go back to being funny. And you go, Mark Twain, Will Rogers, Mort Saul, uh, uh, the best guys in the world talked about what was going on. And so, yeah, I don't have any problem with it. And if you don't like it, eh, go watch a guy that talks about his penis. Uh, you know, and it's, it's that's the truth. I mean, there is uh, there's a lot of people that have um... – you know, have uh, different needs and, and different desires uh, to make them laugh. I, I, I always thought, though, I mean, in this kind of I, I hate to even bring this up, but I guess we should. The whole woke culture. Um, I like punching up. I don't like punching down. Yeah. Um, I've known Chappelle since he was 13 and I was disappointed um, about both the, the thing with the Jews and the thing with uh, trans. I'm not condemning him. I don't want him to lose a gig. Or I, that's not it. But I just I, I have an opinion on it, you know. Um, yeah. Carlin, I think, would have agreed with me. I think that, you know, punch up, man. There's a lot up there to punch at instead of us, you know, I mean, taking the easy route. Now, that said, you know, I mean, comedy's hard. It's yeah. it's extremely difficult, you know? I, my, my opinion about this is, like, I did a movie called Special Unit, which is based, due to the fairness that I wrote and I directed and I produced. Uh, due to the Fairness and Disabilities Act, the LAPD has to hire four handicapped undercover tickets. And I used the word retard in the movie. Any you can do anything, and 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 I I, I kind of want I don't want to I want to defend Dave in a sec in a, in a little in a little way. When I watched the special where he talked about that friend of his that was trans and did stand up, and, and he led him give to a spot talk to him. I remember thinking there's a lot of bro douchebags that follow Dave and they watch Dave, and to have that guy their hero admit that he had a friend that was trans that he thought was funny that at the end he thought was funny and was going to help him. And then, uh, and then, and I, and I get, I, it, Dave's, here's the thing that Dave, here's a trick that Dave pulls a lot. And he did it on SNL too. The trick he pulls is he bumps right up against the edge. And I think CK does that too, where he, where you're not quite sure. Dave has so much money and so much fame. If Dave wanted to come out against somebody, he could. I think he's a, a bit of a, a provocateur in some ways. And then there's other guys that are trying to do what Dave does that are just flat out racist. That are flat. You're like, dude, what are you doing? Uh, um, so Dave, I, 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 the jury for me is not out on Dave yet. But I'll tell you this: uh, when it comes to cancel culture, there is no cancel culture. People, it's not. It, it's, it's 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 this woke thing. It's bullshit. I did special unit. And nobody called me on anything. Do you know why? Because the audience will go. I do a, a, I do a bit about my, my sister's suicide uh, in this new show. Uh, and I do three jokes about the suicide after. And I get applause. It's, it's, it's just bad talent talking about something they can't make work. And, and, and everybody has this thing. And there's, there's, there's some guys that I really respected that went far so far off the rails to the point where – I don't, I don't know what they're doing. They didn't used to be those guys. And here's what happened with this whole, once Reagan killed uh, the um, fairness, fairness doctrine, we lost pretty much any standards when it comes to media or anything. So you can do and or say anything, which is fine. That's freedom of speech. Good and bad, right? I mean, Good I'm, and bad. yeah, yeah. The doctrine's gone. For those that don't know, there was a period of time where if you were on the radio, like I did for like 30 years, you would have to bring on somebody to have another point of view. I would love it. I could not get conservatives to come on my show. I would love it if I was forced to do it and to come on and, and debate them, you know, but to your point, go ahead. Well, the problem is then you have to, then you have to kind of come to a common ground. You have to have your business work. So now what they've done is they've went by taking that off and you don't have to have that. 
your business can work by just spewing hate. And the, and there's some guys that I won't go on their podcast anymore because I'm like, dude, you you. It's not even that you you have a different opinion. It's that you're inaccurate. And when you're a comedian and you're inaccurate, you don't know what. It's like you're just saying stuff to get people yeah. following that uh, following you or watching your show, then you're just, you're just playing into the media narrative. Comedians have a responsibility. Our job is to rattle it a little bit. Our job is to, to point out yeah. the stupidity, Our, you know, and, I was flying recently and I ran into Rob Schneider in the airport and, yeah. um, and we were both standing there waiting and I, and I started to talk to him. If you guys don't know Rob Schneider, you remember him from SNL and he's really conservative Trump supporter. And, Didn't you see? and yeah. And, and I, I said to him, I go, I said, you know, I, I, what happened to you, man? And I didn't mean, I, that sounds provocative. I didn't mean. No, no, like, please tell me. I, I've been wanting to ask him this forever. What happened? Yeah. And he said, he goes, he says, I go, I just woke up. And I'm like, you know, so you know what? He gave me a cell number and we're going to talk. You know, he wants to talk. So I got to give him credit for that. I mean, as much as I don't like what he has to say, he has the balls to come out and say, I'll talk to anybody about it. Well, so, you know, and Rob lost, I know some insights of Rob lost, in the great in the great recession rob lost a ton of money a ton of, whatever he was in he lost a ton of money i mean buildings that he had to sell i mean he lost a ton of money the problem is that there's people are so we have an education problem in the country right now we have an education we have a critical thinking problem in this country which is another thing reagan did reagan actually um, there's an advisor that Reagan had that told him, hey, if a well-educated populist uh, is a dangerous pro proletariat, you, you can't you can't right. manage them. And so Reagan started cutting. He made school in California expensive. He started cutting schools. He didn't even when he became president. He God, I hope he didn't do it for that reason. Do you really? No, think no, 100 percent, 100 percent, because <sighs> you have to remember you have to remember what happened with Reagan is that Reagan. Reagan was an actor, very wealthy actor for a long time. And when he came to California, my mother was mentally ill. Well, Reagan, you know, and, and you know, she was out of the mental hospital at that point. She was living somewhere else, but Reagan shut he down. Him up. Yeah, he shut him down. Shut him yeah, on the street. My wife, my wife works for Salvation Army sometimes. She volunteers there. And 90% of the people on the streets right now are mentally ill, but they have nowhere to go. They used to, but Reagan shut it down. And why did he shut it down? So he could give rich people tax breaks. We have 55 years or whatever it is of trickle down economics. And, and there's been 15 or 20 studies now that have just proved it was a fucking grift. It was a grift. And yeah. so one more thing about these comics. So some of these comedians have found out that if they pull really hard right and start really being right wing conservative psychopaths, they draw an audience. And that audience buys a lot of merch because that audience isn't really the smartest audience. Hey, when I started in talk radio, I was, I was, I didn't know what I was doing. It was 92, 93. And, and so I was kind of conservative social, not socially conservative, but fiscally, I bought that whole rising tide bull. And uh, it, it wasn't until the, the recession in 2000. And then people started talking to me about, um, you know, what was happening with um, mortgage bonds and how, what, a, what, what, how this was just going to blow up. And that, and then of course we all saw it afterwards. It was just like, um, just like Michael Lewis said in the big short, uh, they blamed immigrants and they blamed poor people. And yeah. these banks rigged in trillions and people yeah. on the street lost jobs. Uh, we lost trillions of dollars of wealth in this country because of rich people screwing up, trying to be rich and not caring about the rest of the people. So um, before you go, so tell me, when will we know about this Fox thing? Oh, I don't. I mean, I'll tell you My what. Fingers crossed. I shouldn't say it. I shouldn't say anything. I yeah, don't the know. second it happens, I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, by the way, I'm I'm on, I'm on tour with my new show, Carrying Monsters. It's not political at all. It actually it actually deals with the darkest stuff in my life. It's a it's about living between the tragedies. Because here's how here's how life goes. You ready? Birth, life, tragedy, life, tragedy, first orgasm, life, tragedy, <laughs> life, tragedy, life, tragedy, last orgasm, death, and we hope they happen on the same day. So <laughs> talk about that. But I'll tell you what, man, uh, we need to come up with a, we need to start talking to each other, uh, looking each other in the eyes and just figuring out why, you know, I'd love to, I'd love, I'm going to watch when Rob's on because I want to hear what he has to say. Cause at one point, and the only thing, like, you know, who the, one of the best um, democratic presidents of all time was uh, uh, Eisenhower. If you look what Eisenhower did, man, this dude, the, Eisenhower would be, would be held up as a demon to oh, the yeah. right yeah. now. And, and he guess was, what? He hated Nixon. Hated yeah. Nixon. Yeah. Yes. We just, vice need, president for that. No, we no, just yeah. need good men in power again. Again, I will tell you this. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm an actualist. Show me the facts. And the reason I vote Democrat right now is because they're the ones that use my tax money for me. They're the ones that actually bring the economy back up. And right. they're the ones that fix the problems. They don't blame trans kids. And they sure as hell, I mean, aren't, aren't blaming immigrants. 
in a country that was built on immigrants. Okay, so there you go. That's my last thing. Uh, well, we, we were talking about that earlier. And when, when people talk about immigration and, and they talk about, you know, the borders, I, I just tell them this. And it's it's census actually even confirmed it in 2020. If we don't get strong immigration coming in over the next 20 years, our GDP is going to plummet. We need people who want to come here and work starting out. And I live in San Diego. I live 20 miles from Mexico, where I right where I am right now. And I've never seen a Mexican uh, uh, not working or not looking for work, right. I, I, you know, and, and, and I know that's a generalization and I'm sure, you know, no, no, can, no, no, it's, but, it's, 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 I mean, yes and no, they look at anybody, anybody who's going to pack their stuff in, in their pockets and then walk a thousand miles or 500 miles yeah. to try to get a better life. That's an ass kicker. That's <laughs> you. No and I, I know people sitting in their homes in Texas right now won't won't open the door to go outside. White people and they're blaming the immigrants while you're sitting on your ass watching TV and you weigh 490 pounds. Sorry to all you obese people. I apologize, but for God's sakes, I'm talking about Texas. <laughs> all right, my friend. All right, so where are you right now? What part of the world? Uh, I'm, I live in LA. I'm up in Los Angeles. We're coming down oh. to San Diego on Wednesday. Actually, we have a, a relative got an operation. We're going to help them out. But I, I'm I'm traveling to Philadelphia uh, and next week. I'm going to do helium uh, in in uh, Philly. And uh, I tour the road all the time, man. One thing I love more than anything is stand up comedy. You know why? Because every night people keep telling me how the country's running. I take a poll every night, two yeah. shows on Friday and Saturday. So it's the, hard though being on the country's road. Getting better. Though. Well, I mean, I, I tell people that, you know, you got 23 hours to kill for the one, you know, and you got that one hour. Right. So, yeah. Hey, very, you know, man, I always love seeing you again. Uh, be well, stay safe out there. Okay. I'm, we'll glad we're in, I'm glad we're in contact, my brother. I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Um, Jimmy. Again, Chris Titus, uh, go on, check him out on YouTube, Chris Titus.com. Just one of the funniest people in the world. Uh, one of the other funniest people in the world couldn't be here, but here's Nikki anyway. Uh, Nikki Maduro. Ha <laughs> ha. Nikki Maduro show kicks off in about two hours at noon. I thought, oh, we don't got your sound, baby. Uh oh, here we go. Look, isn't she cute though? While she tries to find her sound. Do we? Is it me or you don't have sound? Oh, do I have sound? Can oh, you hear you're me? there. There you are. Okay. Hello. You know, I am late. I was supposed to be here like a couple minutes ago, and I unplugged everything. And if there's anything that I've learned using this new format, don't unplug it. Don't unplug anything. So there you go. <laughs> Yeah, I know Mark had that problem too. Mark's not here. Mark was Mark's show comes up in a few minutes on yeah. YouTube, uh, the Mark Thompson show. Mm -hmm. Nikki's show kicks off at noon. Yeah. And uh, what do you got today? What are you doing today? So we're going to be doing a lot. We're going to touch on the Colorado thing. That's still just so freaking tragic. And I, did you see this? This really warmed my heart. Look at this. We respect all of our community members, including our LGBTQ community. Therefore, we will be identifying the victims by how they identified themselves. That was just awesome. I loved it. I, I retweeted every single picture with all of their pronouns. And of course, you know, the idiots are out there, you know, oh, this woke BS or whatever. But I think that no, in there, Anderson Lee Aldrich committed mass murder because you complained. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah, I can't stand him. So, yeah, we're going to touch on that. We'll we'll get things a, a bit lighter. Um, I'm going to be actually speaking to our friend Steve Moskowitz about Taylor Swift. So, cause there's some tax implications. <laughs> what time is that? I might have uh, either sometime between noon and two, but I got reached out to Steve. Um, there are tax implications for all you lucky people that spent or plan to spend so much money buying the resale tickets, the sellers and the buyers might have oh, to pay. So you got to pay taxes on that money. Yeah. yeah exactly. by the way, this show and, and Nikki show sponsored by a Moskowitz LLP.com. Mm -hmm. uh, incredible tax attorneys. They've helped me and they still help me and they help my friends. I had a good friend and not filed in eight years. Oh my he God. Graphic designer. He just like got away. He had his, he had a business with his wife and it got, so he was freaking out. So I said, call him. So he yes. spoke to Liz. They had a long conversation. Guess what? When he put everything together, they owed him money wow. after eight That's years of not nice. filing. Now there were some fees and stuff, but it worked anyway. So if, if you have any kind of tax issues, Moskowitz, LLP or triple eight tax deal, eight, eight, eight tax deal. So you sound like you got a big show coming up. I mean, I do. I always do. It's going to be amazing. Award winning. Fabulous. Yeah. All right. Well, Tell everybody I said hi. You be well. I right? will indeed. I'll talk to you later. Bye. The Nikki Medora show. Find her on uh, YouTube. Same place, right down the right down the street from where I am right now. All right, um, we're running out of time. So uh, let me um, let me do a couple things here. Uh, tomorrow's show, uh, John Nichols will be on with me from the Nation, and um, a couple other surprises. I, I hopefully I'll get Rob Schneider on soon. I would love to have a conversation with him, even though 
it might be messy. We'll see. And uh, this is not just going to be a sounding board for uh, Democrats. We're going to try to get everything in here. We're going to start um, trying to get Richard Marx to come on and play a couple songs on the show. Uh, you know, Richard Marx from the 80s. Great guy. He's still working out there. He's great. And uh, trying to get on Fridays, we're going to do something different. A uh, little little, maybe a little bit of stand up comedy. Get a bunch of people in here. Try to create the room. Regardless, um, it's going to be a it's going to be an interesting week. You guys have a great Thanksgiving. I know that it's um, uh, for some people there that may not have family and stuff. Find somebody, reach out, get together with somebody. Be safe, everybody. Until next time, I'm Chip Franklin. Uh, follow me on subscribe. By the way, I forgot to mention that the entire show. Uh, you can subscribe right here and uh, follow us, and we'll do this every day at nine o'clock right here. Be well. See you next time. I can handle things. I'm fine. overcome yes we can person woman man camera tv what the f is wrong with you